Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Misty. Finally, welcome to my prospectus. My work consists of measuring two fundamental aspects of active galaxies. The first one is their distances, and the second one is their supermassive black hole masses. And the way that we make these measurements, you are allowed to make a couple of more measurements of fundamental properties along the way. And I'm really excited to tell you about it, so let's go ahead and jump right in. I'd like to thank my committee, first of all, Missy Bentz, my advisor, my other GSU committee member, Mike Crenshaw, who I see is trying to copy my beard, <laughs> and the other two external committee members that I've had the pleasure and the privilege of working with. The first one is Megan Johnson from the U.S. Naval Observatory, and the other is Hélène Courtois from the University of Lyon 1 in France, and I've been working on my pronunciation. I am sorry if I ruined it with my accent. Um, and the other extragalactic committee member that we will eventually get once we hire somebody. So let's go ahead and get started and let's talk about the first measurement that I care about, which is distances. And here we have the classic Hubble's law that tells us that the further a galaxy is away from us, the faster that it's going to be moving away from us. Distances are one of the most important measurements that we can make for astronomical objects. And that's because so many of their fundamental properties directly rely on the distance that we assume when we make these measurements. So just two as an example, mass and luminosity. Two things that I think we care a lot about when we're making astronomical measurements. For mass specifically, any gas masses that you measure and any supermassive black hole masses that you measure, specifically ones that rely on spatial scales. Anytime you have to change an angular size into a linear size, you have to assume some sort of distance. So black hole mass measurement techniques such as gas dynamical modeling, stellar dynamical modeling, those directly rely on the distance that you assume. And luminosity, of course, goes as the distance squared. And the reason why these fundamental properties are so important is because they tell us which aspects of galaxies are connected to each other or are related to each other. So here on your guys' left is the luminosity of the central bulge of a spiral galaxy or the luminosity of an elliptical galaxy that scales that is connected with a supermassive black hole mass. And on the top you just have the absolute magnitude that's related to the black hole mass. And then here you have the spread in stellar velocities or the stellar velocity dispersion that we measure in the central bulges or in ellipticals that is also connected to black hole mass. And it's mentioned all the time when we bring up these scaling relationships. The spatial scales here are so vastly different that not only are they related, they have influence on each other. That's like saying that a fly in a football stadium has influence over the number of people sitting in it. It's absurd, but they are connected. And what we take away from this, how we interpret this, is that black holes and galaxies grow up, to get, grow up together. They co-evolve. So these scaling relationships show us the influence that each other has over cosmic time. And what properties do we rely on to tell us about these scaling relationships? Luminosity and mass, both of which rely on the distance. And so these relationships tell us how galaxies evolved, and then consequently they tell us how the whole structure of the universe evolves. So if we want to understand the structure of the universe and if we want to understand galaxies, we want to make sure that our measurements of these properties are as accurate as we can possibly make them. So how do we normally measure distance to galaxies? The easiest way, the simplest way, is to just use Hubble's law that tells us if we can measure the galaxy's recessional velocity, which is given to us by however redshifted the emission or absorption lines that we're getting from the galaxy are. And if we know the expansion of the universe, which we do, sort of, then we can solve for the galaxy's distance. When we do that, we're assuming that all of the recessional velocity of the galaxy is due to the expansion of the universe, which is true for far away galaxies. Just like Hubble's law tells us, the farther it is away, the faster it's going to be receding. So you get to a point where a galaxy is in what we call the Hubble flow, which is where, yes, the expansion of the universe is the dominant source of recessional velocity of a galaxy. But in the nearby universe, that's not the case. Because let's say there were a cluster of galaxies over here, and we wanted to track what the motion of the galaxy would be. It would move like that, because gravity is a thing, right? 
any extra tugs that the gravity get uh, the, the gravity that the galaxy gets from gravitational interaction all add to or subtract to the recessional velocity that we measure. So some of the components of motion are from the expansion, absolutely. But there's this other component that we haven't accounted for that's due to the extra tugs that the, that the galaxy gets from gravity. So we can't use this equation anymore for nearby galaxies because we need to account for that extra bit of velocity. And that's what we call the peculiar velocity. And why does this matter? Let's do a little experiment here. We've observed peculiar velocities to be anywhere upwards of 500 kilometers per second for galaxies in the nearby universe, and sometimes even more. So, let's say that you go and you measure a recessional velocity of a nearby galaxy to be 1,500 kilometers per second. Reasonable for a nearby galaxy. Hubble's law would then tell you that that distance is about 21 megaparsecs, assuming a Hubble constant of 70 kilometers per second per megaparsec. Make everybody happy or dishappy, depending on who you ask. But then let's say that that galaxy that you were looking at has a peculiar velocity of 500 kilometers per second. And if you account for that, then Hubble's law tells you that it's 14 megaparsecs, which means that you just overestimated your distance by 50%. That's a lot. And remember, luminosity goes as the distance squared, so now your luminosity is off by a lot squared. So for our targets then, what better things to look at to study galaxy black hole relationships than galaxies that host an active galactic nucleus, or an AGN, where if we were to somehow zoom all the way into the center here, what we would see is something that looks like this, where you have your central supermassive black hole in the center, you then have things that are spiraling inwards while the, get, while the black hole is feeding in an accretion disk. Farther out, you have these thick, photoionized clouds that are still near the gravitational influence of the black hole. So their rotational velocities are still extremely fast, which is going to broaden any emission lines that we're tracking from the region. So we're clever and we call that the broadline region. And then a little further out, you have this thick, dusty torus that's surrounding the entire nucleus. The thing, though, with these galaxies is that, if my remote works, there we go. Most Seiferts, which is just the name of the galaxies, that uh, the name of the main guy who observed these galaxies, most of them only have redshift-based distances. And let's stick with AGN for a second here, because they allow for a very unique way to measure the second thing that I care about, which is the supermassive black hole masses. So let's say that the AGN is oriented this way, where the torus wasn't blocking our view of what's going on in the broadline region, or what's going on near down all the way to the center. Black holes are very messy eaters. So let's say that a flare goes off somewhere near the accretion disk, or any kind of variability that I'm representing with a cartoon flame. From our perspective, if we're tracking what the continuum flux, which is just the energy that's mainly coming from the accretion disk of the system, if we're tracking what's happening to the flux over time, it will suddenly react to the new photons and then it'll kind of fall off. So it'll get this light curve over time. Once that flare goes off, those photons will propagate outwards, just like all light does, and eventually crash into these broadline region clouds. And if we track the flux that we're tracking from the emission lines of the broadline region, which is usually H beta, over time, they would be happily going along and then just suddenly react to the new photons just like the continuum flux did. But there's a delay in time. That's just how long it took the photons to travel from the accretion disk to those broadline region clouds. This is a cartoony, simplistic version of what's known as reverberation mapping, or RM, because that was the only time I'm going to be able to say that phrase today. And we can use the virial theorem that tells us that the central mass here is related by the radius of the broadline region, the velocity of the broadline region clouds, and just the gravitational constant. But we know what that radius is, that distance that the photons traveled. Speed equals distance over time, so photons move at the speed of light. We don't know the distance, but we know how long it took to get there, because that time delay tells us how long it took the photons to get from the accretion disk to the broadline region clouds. So this just becomes speed of light, time delay, the velocity of those broadline region clouds, and the gravitational constant. And then, surprise, we can put these 
on the same scaling relationships that we were looking at for quiescent galaxies, which are ones where the black hole isn't feeding on anything, like our Milky Way. And this is the same one where we have the stellar velocity dispersion on the x-axis, and we have the supermassive black hole mass on the y-axis. RM is what provides the black hole masses for the AGNs in this sample. And we've also found scaling relationships that are specific only to active galaxies, such as this one. That tells us that the more luminous our nucleus is, the larger the radius of the broadline region will be. And the reason why this is so important, or one of the reasons why this is so important, is because supermassive black holes at cosmological distances are estimated using this relationship. Because remember, RM takes time. You have to monitor these galaxies for a large period of time in order to track that time delay. You need to measure light curves over time. So the amount of time that you need to track it is at least what the time delay is, and if not more, to get a very clear light curve for the continuum and for the broadline region. So if you're trying to measure a black hole mass for a galaxy that has a time delay of 100 days or more than that, you're going to have a tough time finding the resources needed to monitor a galaxy for 100 days or more. So all you can do now is measure the luminosity of your nucleus, use this relationship to tell you what your expected radius is, and then use that to estimate what the black hole mass is. And what do we rely on to measure? It's the luminosity, which means that distance is the largest known uncertainty in this radius of the broadline region, luminosity of the AGN relation, or the RL relation. Only six of these dots have distances that are independent of their redshifts. And so we find ourselves at a crossroads. Let's first solve this distance problem, and then we'll go off and we'll measure some supermassive black hole masses. So, I've been telling you this whole time that redshifts are bad to use in the local universe because the peculiar velocities can affect them in a, in a very dramatic way. So now the question is, what do we have available to us that can measure the distance that has nothing to do with the redshifts of these objects? All of those methods are collected in what we call the cosmic distance ladder. That was supposed to be a dramatic moment. <laughs> The name of the game for most of these methods is to compare the brightness that we measure on Earth, or the apparent magnitude, to the intrinsic brightness of something, or its absolute magnitude. And the difference between those two will tell you what the distance is. It's easy for us to measure distances on Earth, constraining what the absolute brightness of something is a little bit more tricky. So what we're left with is observing very simple, simple, simple observable traits that happen to be linked, that scale, with the absolute magnitude of the object that we're looking for. So we observe something easy, we use the relationship to track what the absolute magnitude is, compare it to our magnitude, and we can constrain the distance. So what we want to do with this is go through each one rather quickly and see what distance measurement method would be best to provide a large number of distances to our active galaxies that's also doable within the timeline of a dissertation. So, knowing that most of our galaxies are hosted, most of our AGN are hosted in spiral galaxies, and most of them are in the nearby universe. So first off, anything smaller than the diameter of the Milky Way is obviously out. Cepheids, the relationship between the period of pulsation of a variable star and its absolute magnitude, is a great thing to use. Everything after this is based on the calibration that we have for Cepheids. They're bright and blue, they're easy to see, but they only go out to about 40 megaparsecs, and you need to resolve each individual star over time because you need to track their period. So you need very powerful telescopes with very powerful resolving power, like HST. And we all know how easy it is to get HST time. So easy, in fact, that you know how many AGN host galaxies have Cepheid-based distances that are published? Two. One of which was measured just a couple of months ago by MISTI. So they're great when we have the data, but not doable to measure a large amount of distances. Stars on the tip of the red giant branch are used as standard candles in the infrared. They're a bit dimmer than Cepheid, so they're harder to see, and you've got to worry about reddening and extinction in the other galaxies that you're looking at. And, just like Cepheids, they only go out to about 40 megaparsecs, and you still have to resolve each individual star. So it's doable, but not very realistic for what we're trying to do. Luminosity functions 
require you to measure a large amount of luminosities to either planetary nebulae or globular clusters, and relies on the fact that you say that you can reliably separate their luminosity from anything else that might be going on. That's great for ellipticals, because they're just big balls of stars. For spiral galaxies, you've got dust, you've got gas, you've got a bunch of other fuzzy stuff floating around. So you've got to worry about, again, extinction, you've got to worry about reddening. So not what we're looking for. Surface brightness fluctuations tracks how many of the stars in the galaxy that you can resolve, or chunks of stars. So the more stars that you can resolve, the closer that it must be to you. So you're relying on kind of fuzziness to measure how far your galaxy is. That's great for ellipticals, because again, they're just balls of stars. So the more fuzziness that you see, you know that's more, more of the stars that you're resolving, which means that you can get a very reliable distance. Spirals, on the other hand, are messy, dusty, and gassy. So they're messing with the fuzziness that you're relying on for a distance indicator. So not good for our sample. The Faber-Jackson relation is a correlation between the stellar velocity dispersion and the absolute magnitude of ellipticals. Are you seeing a pattern here? <laughs> so not good for our sample. Supernovae are great standard candles. So if anybody in this room knows when one is going to go off before it goes off, please let me know. Otherwise, we're just kind of sitting waiting around for one to happen. And then, of course, our galaxies are too close to be caught in the Hubble flow, so we don't want to use that one either. Well, gee whiz, process of elimination, which one do we want to use? The Tully-Fisher relation. What is the Tully-Fisher relation? It says that the more massive a spiral galaxy is, the faster that it's going to rotate. And the other idea is that light traces mass. Where you find mass in the universe, you will find light. So now this relationship becomes, the faster a spiral galaxy rotates, the brighter its intrinsic luminosity is going to be. And this is exactly what this plot is showing. This is the log of the maximum rotation rate of spiral galaxies. That's correlated with the absolute magnitude in the I band, with some corrections thrown in that you have to make to magnitudes. Okay, so this is breaking up into two parts. We measure rotation, and then we worry about the brightness. So if we want to measure rotation, what part of a spiral galaxy is rotating? That would be the disk. They're all disk galaxies. So now our next question is, which part of the EM spectrum do we want to look in to see most of the disk? And for those of you who've been seeing me give talks for years, I know we talk about the same stuff every time. Just pretend you haven't seen it before. Sit tight, I've got more stuff, I promise. So this is an optical image of a nearby galaxy from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. Now just for comparison, for the same galaxy on the same scale, this is what it looks like in the ultraviolet. This is from the Galaxy Evolution Explorer. You can see that we're seeing more disk structure here because those big bright blue stars are emitting in the ultraviolet, so it's tracing them out. But it's probably still not where we want to look for spiral galaxies. So for the same galaxy on the same scale, this is what it looks like in the radio. Just a tad bigger, I would say. This is all of the neutral hydrogen in a galaxy that's emitting in the radio. Neutral hydrogen is the most abundant element in the universe, and it's the most abundant element in spirals. So, this is what we want to see to track the total amount of detectable matter, the stuff that we can see in the disk. And we've got to measure how fast this thing is rotating. So how do we do that? We can do rotation curves, which requires you to resolve the disk, and then track what the circular velocity is in radial steps outwards. That takes a lot of time, and it also requires you to resolve parts of the disk with ground-based radio interferometers. For most of our galaxies, that is absolutely not the case. So instead, how about we put the entire galaxy in one beam and condense all of that rotational info into one single unresolved emission line? And here's how that works. Here's my spectrum. I've got velocity on the x-axis, and I've got my neutral hydrogen flux, or H1 flux, on the y-axis. If nothing was moving, I would have a nice Gaussian curve, but these are disks. So one part of the disk is always going to be coming towards us, and one part is always going to be going away from us. So this emission line is going to be split depending on how fast the galaxy is rotating. The faster it rotates, the farther apart these two peaks are going to be. <coughs> and so in real life, we'll target an AGN host galaxy. We'll observe it for a little bit with a radio telescope. The Green Bank Radio Telescope is our choice. It's a 100 meter dish. And after some time, you arrive with a single, unresolved, rotationally broadened 
A20 mission line. And so in 2013, <laughs> Ben Uyang observed, or he targeted 31 AGN host galaxies with the GBT, and he detected 18 of them. And then a spry young lad showed up a couple of years later. Missy and I submitted a proposal to observe 17 more active galaxies with the GBT. That was approved for 165.25 total observing hours. I'll get back to that in a second. But after all was said and done, I detected 13 out of the 17 that we originally targeted. Four, more time than we asked for. So that is a grand total on one screen, for one slide, this is a grand total of 208.25 observing hours. All observed by me, all by me. And remember, this is radio. So when the wavelengths get to 21 centimeters long, they stop caring about what the weather is doing. So you can observe these things day or night, rain or snow. So I still twitch anytime somebody says the phrase sleep schedule around me. <laughs> the only time that an observing session got canceled is when the telescope was literally frozen. <laughs> anyway, so when you have all of this data and some other resources, you can measure a good number of fundamental properties about these galaxies. And I wrote those up and we published that paper last summer. The first thing is the emission line widths. Remember, it's rotationally broadened, so the width of those emission lines will tell you what the projected rotational velocity is. And you need to know something about the inclination of the system, which usually comes from the axis ratio from optical data. So you can project it down and, and constrain what the maximum rotation rate is. You can measure recessional velocities and hence the redshifts. Redshifts from H1 are the most reliable ones you can use for other galaxies because the warmer ones like H alpha, forbidden O3, those can get influenced by the internal motions that they're in. So the warmer ones can get pushed out radially. There can be inflowing and outflowing motions for AGN. That'll affect what their recessional velocity is and it'll affect what the redshifts that we measure. H1 is cold and it's just rotating. It's at about 100 Kelvin. So if you look in between the redshifts and blue shifts, you have a very reliable indicator as what the systemic velocity of the, of the object is. You can measure gas masses. H1 is very optically thin, which means the densities are very low, which means that approximately every photon that comes from a hydrogen atom gets to us here on Earth. So the flux that we measure from H1 is directly related to how many hydrogen atoms are in the beam of our telescope. So we can constrain what the H1 flux is, and then all we have to do because hydrogen is the most abundant element in the universe. What's the second most abundant element? Helium. So all we have to do is scale it up by whatever the, nat the normal abundance of helium is. And you have a constraint as what your total gas mass is. And finally, if you add up all of the mass that you have in gas with all the mass that you have in stars, which were constrained by MISTI last year, then you have a constraint as to what the total baryonic matter of these galaxies are. And so, okay, we've got our rotational information. Now we got to worry about the brightness. So where does our optical data come from? The majority of it comes from the Hubble Space Telescope. MISTI has obtained V-band images of all of the galaxies in our sample. We have some from the Lick Observatory. One of our new doctors, Michelle Silverstein, observed some of our galaxies with the 0.9 meter at APO. We have some from WISE, some from the MDM Observatory, some from FALKS. I and some of Mike's group observed some with a 3.5 meter at APO. And then I observed some with <coughs> ArcSat. <laughs> Hold on. <coughs> As some of you may know, I ran into some issues with this telescope. Some technical, some instrumental, some emotional. <laughs> but, but it behaved itself sometimes. This is a, it's a fine image. It's a fine image of our galaxy. Sometimes it misbehaved. <laughs> And I really, or I learned that this was balancing issues, tracking issues, and moth guts. <laughs> anyway, for these brightnesses, we want to measure the stellar components of the galaxy. We want to measure the thing that's tracing out the mass. For our galaxies, they have a really bright nucleus in the center, which can sometimes outshine all of the combined stellar light of our galaxies. So what this looks like, or what this does to the distances that we're trying to measure, is it's like a giant flashlight that's making the galaxy appear brighter and closer than what it should be. So what we want to do somehow is measure the galaxy brightness separately from the brightness of the nucleus. So we can turn off that flashlight and make the galaxy go back to where it's supposed to be. And so how do we do that? 
Well, I got a nice preview from Rachel last week. We use a surface brightness decomposition software called Galfit. And this is how it works. We start with our original image, and what we're going to do is we're going to build the brightnesses of each of the morphological components of our galaxy separately. So for spiral galaxies, that's a disk, that's a bar, a bulge, maybe a ring, and an AGN in our case. And we want to build these and stack these up individually. So let's just start with the brightness of the disk, and then how we always tell how good our model is compared to reality, we just subtract the two, and this is just counts. So zero counts is gray, which means we've subtracted all of our photons, excuse me, which is good. White is under subtracted, black is under subtracted. I'm sorry, white is under subtracted, black is over subtracted. And you can see just by taking away the disk brightness, we've gotten rid of some of those wispy components, but there's still a huge under subtracted region in the center, mostly due to that big bright bar over there. So let's throw, well first let's throw an AGN in there, let's throw a bulge in there. Didn't do much because that bar is so bright, so let's throw in a bar and then see how our residual is doing. Getting there. But there's still this huge under subtracted region in the center. You guys see this, this lens-like structure in the center of the bar? Yeah, we're clever, so we call that a bar lens. <laughs> let's throw a bar lens in there and then let's see how our residual does. That yeah, looks pretty good. So now we've got our kind of Jenga set of galaxy components with the AGN sitting right on top. So all we have to do then is flick off the AGN and add up all the other components so that we have a constraint on what the total galaxy brightness is separate from that nucleus contamination. Looks pretty good, right? That was my first try. <laughs> no, no, it wasn't. Yeah. Sorry, maybe I missed something. So is the bar lens not contaminated by the AGN itself? Separate. The AGN is so tiny in there, but it's spread out from you know, the seeing or whatever, but the bar lens is such a bigger structure. It's able to constrain those separately as long as you can separate the, the angular size of each. Yeah, no, that wasn't my first try. Uh, this thing is so thoughtful that it prints out this for you every time it crashes. <laughs> Which, yeah, for the first time, it's funny. On the 16,437th time on the same galaxy, it's not that funny. So, I would like to share some preliminary results with you. For the galaxy that I've been using as my guinea pig the whole time, NGC 4395, 4593, excuse me, there is a galaxy called 4395. I'm measuring distances in the B and R bands of about 37 to 38 megaparsecs, which means a peculiar velocity on the order of 100 kilometers per second, which means it's a relatively isolated galaxy, which is good. And we always want to compare these to any other distance estimates that might be out there. Not redshift, mind you, but anything else that would tell us if we're in the ballpark, if we're getting some of the same consistent answers. There's a program in recent years called Cosmic Flows that measures distances to thousands of galaxies in our local supercluster, Laniakea, and, oh, I shouldn't have that in my pocket. But anyway, after it measures the distances, it subtracts off the Hubble flow, so all that you're left with is the local peculiar velocity field. The colloquium speaker on Tuesday stole some of my thunder, but hopefully you're still entertained. And so you can go to a specific region in the sky from their peculiar velocity model and say, in this region of the sky, if I'm measuring this recessional velocity, what's my expected distance going to be? Now, I'm no mathematician, but uh, those seem pretty close. Another galaxy, NGC 6814. I'm getting a little bit of a spread in distances from 22 to 26 megaparsecs. Part of that, a small part of it, is due to the intrinsic scatter of these calibrated relationships in whatever band that you're looking in. The bigger reason is that that's an ArcSat image. So, but this is the galaxy that MISTI has measured a Cepheid distance for, which is 21.65 megaparsecs. So, we're still getting pretty close. And for the last galaxy I want to show you, NGC 3227, I'm getting 25, 26 megaparsecs with a slightly larger peculiar velocity of negative 400 kilometers per second. There's a couple of things that we can compare to. The first is a previous Tele Fisher B-band distance, which AGNs emit mostly in the blue light. This distance didn't take into account how bright the nucleus was. And so with taking out the AGN light, we're pushing it a little farther, which is nice, which is what we'd expect. And it's interacting with its friend here, who's an elliptical galaxy, that has a surface brightness fluctuation estimate of 23.5 megaparsecs. 
And these are interacting, which means they should be close, which they are. All good things. And once you have rotational information for all these galaxies, and you have an idea as to what their physical extent is, then you can start to do something else that's interesting, which is break down the different kinds of masses in the system. So first off, we have the baryonic mass, which we've constrained to be about 1 times 10 to the 11 solar masses. If you can constrain their radii and how fast they're rotating, which we can, then you can use the virial theorem to tell you how much mass needs to be in this system in order to produce the rotation that we observe. That mass is almost 2 times 10 to the 12 solar masses, which means that we have an unaccounted mass of about 1 and a half times 10 to the 12 solar masses. Where is all of that mass? What is it? That's your dark matter. And no, I don't care what it's made of, Todd. <laughs> it's just an unaccounted for number. It can be whatever you like. So every galaxy that we have rotational information for, so every galaxy where we have a dual horn profile, where we can recover some of the rotational information, we can constrain what the dynamical and the dark matter masses are. So that's about 24 galaxies in our sample. And so what we want to do with these, we've already studied what the relationship between the baryonic and the black hole mass is, but we want to see how those dark matter and dynamical masses scale with the black hole. And the other thing that I have in progress is the optical calibrations of the Tully-Fisher relation. As of right now in the literature, Tully-Fisher is calibrated for B, R, I, and H bands. Notice one that's missing. I'm working on the V band. There's just a couple of different corrections that we're settling on. But once we have this calibrated, this will be the most distances that we'll be able to constrain because we have HST V-band images of all of our galaxies. So all which we have rotational information on, we can constrain what their V-band distance is. So again, that's 24 galaxies. And we can compare that to the distances that we're getting from ground-based data. I have eight constrained distances for galaxies where I've reliably separated the AGN light from the galaxy light in two to three filters each. So that's 19 optical models 19 distances for a total of eight galaxies. And we do that because if we have multiple measurements of the distance of a galaxy, we can have a very good constraint as to what the uncertainty would be, depending on how many filters we have. Mike and his group observed some of our galaxies in December, and we have time to observe an additional six with a 3.5 meter at APO in February. So if the weather is kind to us, which we know APO happens all of the time, then we have the potential to double our sample of distances based on ground-based data in multiple filters. So we have the majority of our sample that we can get a very good constraint as to what our uncertainties are by comparing it with these different filters. So that will wrap up distances, and now we can go to the second thing that I'm interested in, which are those black hole masses. Remember my cartoon diagram of RM? We're using the virial theorem like we used for the dynamical masses. So this is what we call the virial mass. It assumes that everything is moving in nice Keplerian orbits. The thing with the broadline region is that it's unresolved. So this virial mass doesn't take into account any of the unknown geometry or kinematics that might be going on in the broadline region. Most of it, the majority of what we don't know is how it's inclined. Remember, in order to measure rotational velocities, the thing that's rotating has to be inclined somewhat to you in order to get more radial velocities. We know that they have to be somewhat face-on because if they were completely edge-on, the torus would be blocking our view of the broadline region. So we know that they have to be at a low inclination, but we don't know which one it is. And so all of those uncertainties are accounted for in this F factor, the scaling factor. So what we would like instead to measure more precise masses is have velocity resolved, high cadence, high quality RM data, and then a way to have a constraint or a view on what the kinematics and the geometry are in the system. If only there were data out there like that that we could use. I have to thank Misty again because there just so happens to be that kind of data. So this is the kind of stuff that I'm talking about here. Is it one example, one galaxy, ARP-151, from the LIC AGN monitoring program, or LAMP. You have a beautiful broadened H-beta emission line here. You have your B-band continuum light curve. Remember, AGNs emit mostly in the blue, so you can use the B-band to track the continuum, or you can use the continuum itself. And you have your H-beta light curve. And what do I mean by velocity resolved? 
Here's what I mean. Take your H beta emission line in velocity space versus flux. And let's say we have our black hole here and we have our broadline region clouds here and we're viewing it from here. So take this out of the screen. You're going to be the Earth and I'm going to reenact the broadline region. And what we want to do, instead of relying on a mean time lag for the whole system, which is what you normally do for RM, let's break the H beta flux into different bins, velocity bins, and then take the flux in each bin and measure what the time lag is for each individual bin. So we're sampling what the individual time lags are for each piece of velocity. And remember, for something that's rotating, you have a gradient of velocities. So we're taking bits and pieces of the broadline region and seeing how they individually react to the time lags. And so here, I've got lower time lags here, higher time lags up here, I've got my velocity, and the dashed line is the systemic velocity of the galaxy that we're looking at. If the broadline region was just rotating with normal, nice Keplerian orbits, we would get a nice symmetric time lag pattern. If things were dominantly outflowing, then what would happen is, from your perspective, gas is being radially driven away from the black hole in all directions. So the side that's closest to you will have gas that's being pushed towards you, so it'll be blue shifted. And then on the far side of the black hole, the gas will be being pushed away from you, so that gas will be red shifted. And what we would see in our lag times then is the red shifted gas would lag behind the blue because it's farther away from you. If instead you had dominant inflowing motions, which is the opposite effect, then gas is falling down onto the black hole. So from your perspective, gas is receding from you to the black hole, so it's blue shifted, and gas on the far side is falling inwards, sorry, red shifted, and then falling inwards, which is blue shifted. So what we would see in the time lag pattern is the opposite effect. The blue would lag behind the red shifted gas. And that's exactly what we observe for this galaxy. Well, we can take this even a step further. Let's not rely on something that we can get from the raw data. Let's take the data and model what the continuum is doing. So connect all the gaps in the data points so you can sample what the AGN continuum is doing at any arbitrary point in time. And then what you do is you just pick a geometry, any geometry that you want, run your continuum model through it and see if it can reproduce what the H beta flux is doing. If it can't, throw it away, pick a new one. And keep iterating through until you arrive at a family of geometries and kinematics that can reproduce what the H beta light curve is doing. And that's exactly what we see here. Here are all these different colored lines here, are draws from the family of, of continuum models that we've arrived at. And here is the result in red of our recreated broadline broad continuum light curve and some other random draws from our family of models. And so what you arrive at is what the broadline region would actually look like and what the kinematics are, what the geometry is, what the inclination is. So what this is starting to look like for the more galaxies that we do this for is something like this. And this is just in space coordinates. So you have the x-axis here, the y-axis here, and the z-axis up top. So the one on your right is what the broadline region would look like if you took a straight line from the Earth to the galaxy. And then on the other side here is the exact same thing except from, ed from an edge-on view. And so what we see is it's at a low inclination, which is what we expect, and it's this fluffy disk. Not a thin disk per se, but it's a little puffed up. And we have a constraint on the geometry, the kinematics, and so all we need to do is ask what mass needs to be here at the center in order to reproduce the things that we're observing. And so we arrive at a primary, direct, black hole mass constraint for every galaxy where we can do this with the broadline region. Regular RM is black hole mass measurement, but it's a secondary measurement because we still need to rely on that F factor. Here we don't have to worry about an F factor. We know what the black hole mass constraint is. And so for every galaxy where we have a model of the broadline region, we can compare what our constraint of the black hole mass is to what RM says it is and see how much they agree or if we don't agree. So that means that we can measure individual F factors for every one of these galaxies. Just to make sure that since we assume one F factor for the entire family of AGNs, measuring individual ones will tell you how we're doing for the large family of AGNs. And so we've done this for a small sample of galaxies. Here are some examples. And so every F factor that we measure, we're seeing, they go 
above or below the value that we're getting, but we know that we're getting pretty close for the, for the whole sample of AGNs. Individual ones may be a little bit more off, but for the, everything that's going on, we're doing pretty good. And so the more that we see these, the more that we're seeing repeating patterns. We see consistent puffy disk structures. We see low inclination orientations, which is good, things that we expect. And all of these are dominated by Keplerian motion with inflowing motions on top of them. And all of these have primary direct black hole mass measurements. And so the more that we do this for, the more precise black hole mass measurement constraints that we arrive at for the AGNs in our sample. So my job now is to do this for five new galaxies that haven't had this done before. And here are my friends that I'll be working with for the rest of my time. These are kind of the all-stars of the Seifert ones. All of these have that high quality velocity resolved RM data that I showed you before, where you've got your continuum light curves, you've got your H beta light curves, and you've got your light curves from Forbidden 03 that are used to calibrate your spectroscopic measurements. And so my job is to model the continuum light curves of all of these, constrain a family of geometries that the broadline region can have, and constrain primary direct black hole mass measurements for these five galaxies. And something more interesting that we could do, the more galaxies that we do this for, is directly compare and contrast different black hole mass measurement techniques. We can't do that for a lot. In fact, these are two of the only galaxies that we can do that for. And the reason why we want to do this is that every black hole mass measurement technique that you use comes with its own assumptions. And how do you know whether those assumptions are accurate or not accurate? You use another measurement that has a different set of assumptions, and then you compare and contrast. Theoretically, every method that we have should agree. In practice, that's never the case. And so we want to do this for galaxies that have other measurement techniques so that we can compare as many as we can. So for NGC 4151 here, there's regular RM. There's a constraint from gas dynamical modeling. And then we have two stellar dynamical modeling measurements, one from 2014 and another from Dr. Caroline Roberts in her dissertation last year. And then for 3227, we have RM, we have gas dynamics, and we have stellar dynamics. There's another galaxy we can do this for coming down the pipeline from stellar dynamical modeling, and that'll come from Katie Reyes in a couple of years. But the more that we do this, the more that we compare, the better idea that we'll have about how we measure black holes, what the black hole masses that we're getting, how accurate are they, which means that we can go back and constrain further those scaling relationships that tell us how galaxies evolve and how the universe's structure evolves. So when all is said and done, what is my master plan? By the end of this semester, I will have a completed draft of paper two that will report all of those Tully-Fisher distances and those black hole scaling relationships, which means by the summer, I will be beginning that broadline region dynamical modeling. By the end of next spring, I will have that modeling complete and I'll begin writing the next paper. By the summer and through the fall, that draft of the paper will be completed, which means that I will begin my completely fun, arduous process of writing my dissertation. And in spring, two years from now, I will be back up in front of you, hopefully just hours away from adding three letters to the end of my name. And so, thank you all for coming. I hope you had fun. I'll leave you with something fun. My, uh, my favorite goof from the original Batman movie. His, uh, his belt that I've been using for my timeline tracker wasn't built into the suit, and so there's been, uh, there was a couple <laughs> wardrobe malfunctions. And so uh, pay attention to his belt right here. Boop. <laughs> Thank you all so much. <laughs>